that should not have played. Hi everyone! As usual, in this time and place we have yet another lecture on financial markets microstructure. So how is everyone doing today? Give me a 1 in chat if you are doing well. Give me a 2 in chat if you are slowly going insane in these quarantine times. Or give me a 3 in chat if you are rapidly going insane. Oh well. Well, good to see that you have uh, your things together, at least to some extent. Um, my personal insanity is, you know, trying to make this course more interactive, and uh, it's been a bit difficult with this online format. Uh, we already have more chatters today than we had in uh, any of the previous streams, I think. So, I'm gonna try um, today to keep this kind of uh, thing up. So what we will do today is we will have a few small blitz quizzes during the lecture and they will work uh, as follows. So I will just ask you a question, give you some time to think and the question will be multiple choice and uh, you just post your uh, responses in chat. And we'll see how that works. Hopefully it will liven things up at least a little bit. So there's that. Uh, in other announcements, if you haven't seen announcements on Absalon, then, or if you have seen some but not others, we will not have a exercise class this Friday, contrary to what I said previously. And uh, shame on all of you for not telling me that it's Easter Friday and we should not have had a class this Friday. So I'll probably put up a poll sometime later to uh, give you a choice whether you want to have an exercise class next Friday. So we have one scheduled in two weeks. So we'll have that. And there's one more I owe you, so we can do it next Friday or in three weeks from now to stick to every second Friday pattern. So I'll pull up this poll. I will also upload the problem set number two at uh, some point this weekend. Or, well, until the end of the week. And you will have until... Well, as usual, just a little less than two weeks, probably. So until Friday uh, in two weeks to finish it. It will be generally similar to problem set one. You'll have uh, some math problems based on models that we've covered in class and you will have some probably article to read and comment upon uh, with a more as a more open-ended question and also I think I have finally figured out my sound setup so uh, you should hear me mumbling a lot clearer now with less noise echo and uh, clipping but as usual, let me know if uh, something's wrong, if uh, I'm too loud, too quiet, especially compared to the mix. With all that said, let us jump right into the class, and I will run the intro once again because it's easier to edit things for YouTube this way. So, brace, brace yourselves. Yourself. Yourself. Today, on Financial Markets Microstructure, we will be talking about the value of liquidity. As usual, first uh, we start with a small refresher of what happened last week. Last week we were talking about uh, transparency and how it matters for markets. 
We have covered a lot of different kinds of transparency, meaning what kind of information can be available to different parties in the market. And what we saw is that typically in most of uh, the aspects, in most of the issues that we saw, transparency benefits the uninformed traders, which explains why the regulators typically try to, uh, typically want to instill transparency uh, regulation upon the market. But at the same time, transparency typically hurts the informed traders and uh, may sometimes hurt the dealers, the market makers, which in turn explains why exchanges themselves and market platforms are typically trying to avoid being transparent since you might think that insiders and dealers have a larger, have more power in um, choosing which rules will be adopted. Yes, today we will talk about the value of liquidity. And um, in what we saw so far, in what we've seen up to this point, we typically said that, you know, asset has some fundamental value. And we are looking at how the price at which this asset is traded in the market deviates from this fundamental value due to limited liquidity. So how does liquidity um, introduce the inefficiency in prices? So what we'll do today is we will turn the tables, flip things around, and we will ask, you know what? How does limited liquidity itself affect the asset value? And one motivating example comes from this um, old paper from 1991. I already forgot how to do everything in the week past. Um, and it concerns US uh, treasury notes and bills. So as you probably know, U.S. Treasuries are um, U.S. government bonds. So it's how the U.S. government, U.S. Fed, uh, makes, gets its loans, loans its money. And notes and bills are pretty much the same thing, except that notes are issued as a more long-term debt. So they are typically, uh, they typically have maturities between two and 10 years, while bills are more short-term and they are issued with maturities of uh, less than a year. But thing is, once these notes and bills are issued, they are freely traded in the secondary markets. So when a note comes close to expiry or close to maturity, it becomes more or less equivalent to a bill. So here is my question to you. And it is time for our first Blitz Quiz! I maybe should have had some theme music for it, but... Also, I know that's not how you spell Blitz, but I thought it's worth it. So, my question to you is... Which of these two is cheaper, well, given the same face values? A note, which has second, say, uh, six months to maturity, or a bill with six months to maturity? in the secondary market, of course. Or do you think they are they cost about the same? This is a bit of a trick question, but if you think fast and hard, I believe you can guess it. And I'll give you 30 seconds and they start. Opinions are quite split. Some people think it's a note, some people think it's a bill. Uh, does anyone uh, have any intuition for why their answer is, their answer is the correct one? 
why you think that note is cheaper or the bill is cheaper? So I will take that as a no, but if you're still typing, then feel free to finish typing. Notes are more illiquid. Um, that's actually correct. So of course, from the from today's lecture, uh, from the topic of today's lecture, you can infer that if one of these are cheaper, if one of these trades at a discount, then it's probably because uh, they are less liquid. And in our case, it's true that notes are uh, less liquid and they are traded at a discount for this very reason. Or at least, you know, it was the case in 1991. The question though is uh, why are notes less liquid? And that's an interesting question. We will get back to it a little bit later today. So I will not spoil the answer right now, uh, but you you are free to to think about it. So for now, let us um, use this motivating example to proceed with the with the with the theme. And let us first try to establish this first connection between liquidity and the price. And the question is, why does liquidity affect asset value at all? So how, how does this work? Why are less liquid assets traded at a uh, discount? So intuitively it's very... It's well, pretty much trivial. A less liquid asset is more difficult to trade. So presumably if you're buying an asset today, you are probably expecting to sell it at some point. Maybe in a day, maybe in a week, maybe in a month, maybe in 50 years. But at some point you probably will need this uh, money back. So, and you realize that when you will be trying to sell this asset back to the market, you will have to incur all these trading costs that stem from limited liquidity. And you incorporate these trading costs into your current valuation for the asset. So when you buy the asset today, you expect that you will have to suffer from limited liquidity further down the road and you take this transaction costs into your evaluation. Equivalent way of phrasing that is you require an extra return on the asset that compensates for these costs. So if you're willing to pay less for something that's, uh, that generates the same cash flows, it's equivalent to saying that you require a higher return given the same cash flows for, um, small, for smaller liquidity. So these two are more or less equivalent formulations. You require a higher return or you are willing to trade at a lower price. Another aspect that is worth pointing out is that not only liquidity is limited, but it also can change over time. So liquidity in general fluctuates. And um, if, say, illiquidity rises over time, the asset price will fall over time or liquidity premium will grow over time. And so if you think this is the case, if you think that future liquidity is random, this is yet another risk factor that you should incorporate when you're trying to price your asset, when you're trying to establish your valuation for the asset, when you're trying to find out how much you're willing to pay. Meaning that this liquidity risk may actually be priced. It may affect asset prices, and if so, we should be able to see it in the data. That's another thing that we'll be talking about today. And the general plan for today is this. 
it's quite big. I am not sure if we will be able to cover all of this today, but the worst case scenario is we will overflow to the next week. So probably this last general model uh, will happen next week. But what we start with is a very, very simple toy model of liquidity premium. And this model is due to Amihud and Mendelssohn. And it's yet another oldie but goodie from all the way in 1986. So if you remember very, 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 very far back in one of the first lectures, I told you that there are two approaches to, um, well, basically asset pricing. Or, yeah, let's call it asset pricing. There is a cash flow method and there is a fundamental value method. In one case, in the, in the cash flow method, you look at the cash flows that the asset is expected to generate and you put a price on those. In the second, in the fundamental value method, you just assume that the, there is some fundamental, fundamentally correct value of the asset and you are trying to basically set the price based on that fundamental value or based on your knowledge of this fundamental value. And I promised you that we will only care about this second approach. Guess what? I lied. So this is how... Uh, this is the first case when we deviate from it to some extent. Not fully yet, uh, but probably not the last. So we'll probably have something like this in uh, when, when we will talk about bubbles. So in this model, agents do not care about fundamental value but they explicitly care about resale value of the asset. So they buy the asset with an intent to sell it back to the market in some time. So in particular, we have an asset with some fixed spread. And we'll say that it's just some constant value S. But the ask and bid and the mid quote vary over time. And we'll say that it's a constant relative spread rather than a constant absolute spread. So in this formulation, ask and bid prices can be expressed uh, in terms of the mid quote and the spread, always uh, this way. It's just from how we defined uh, the mid quote which is here, and the fixed spread. So what happens in the model is we have one agent who is buying the asset at today's ask price AT. This agent will hold the asset for some fixed number of periods H. And then our agent will sell the asset at BT plus H at the bid price that will be in the market in H period. As usual, we will cheat in a lot of ways. So we will suppose zero dividend over the lifetime of the asset. So we say the asset does not pay dividend. Let's say it's just a zero coupon bond for simplicity. And we will more or less assume that there is no uncertainty. That asset price, uh, that this asset is safe and it just grows deterministically. So what we want to find out is the rate of return on this asset. The rate at which the price, this mid price MT, will grow in the market. So we will start by saying that investor requires some fixed return level R, small r. This is some, well, risk-adjusted return per period. This is, as usual, your opportunity cost of money. This is the return that you can get by investing somewhere else, in any other asset, or in the best of other available assets. So to invest in this particular asset that we are looking at, the agent requires rate of return of at least R, and we'll say that it's exactly R, so what should happen in the market is that you spend 80 today 
you expect to receive some expected BT plus H in the future. And this payout, this future payout, should be um, equal to your initial investment uh, with rate of return R. So you get 1 plus R for each dollar you invested in the asset, for each dollar in AT. And you get 1 plus R per period, there are a total of H periods. So total return on your asset is AT times 1 plus R to the power H. And that should be exactly the, the... This is the minimal return that the investor is willing to accept. And we'll say that it's exactly the return in the market, meaning that this is exactly equal to the uh, price at which the asset is sold after H periods. So if we plug in the expressions for AT and BT that we had in the previous slide, uh, where both of these prices were expressed in terms of spread and the mid quote, you will get this expression. So to remind you, AT was equal to mid quote MT times 1 plus half, half spread, and BT was the mid quote times 1 minus the half spread. So these are the terms that you got from uh, this. So we get this expression, and re uh, recall what we are trying to find is the nominal rate of return on the asset. So given that investors require real risk-adjusted return R, small r, what is the big R, the nominal rate of return on the asset? So which is the rate R at which the price of the asset should grow in the market. So this is the R we are trying to find. And let us uh, derive it on the whiteboard. So what we have is MT equal to expectation of MT plus H over 1 plus r to the power h times 1 minus half spread divided by 1 plus plus the half spread. And we also have an expression, the definition of our nominal rate of return R, and this is this. So let us just plug this definition of R into our uh, expression for the required return. I'm not sure how to call it. What we will have there is, so we just substitute this MT and this expectation of MT plus H by this 1 plus R to the power H. So what you will have is Okay, I uh I was confused by the by the signs there for a second. So what we will have is one plus r to the power h is the uh, the right hand side in the variant, and we'll put everything else into the kind of left hand side, and we'll flip them around. So we'll have one plus big r to the power h equals to one plus small r to the power h plus the inverse of this fraction. We'll have plus at the top and minus at the bottom. Yeah, that looks correct. What we will do now 
is we will cheat because that's what we do so we will assume that all of these values are kind of really really small so that big r small r and the spread are small and i will not tell you what small means but they are small enough so that we can use the following approximation uh, so that we can use the approximation log of 1 plus x is equal to x. This is the approximation that we're going to use. It is valid if x is small enough, so that's why we need r, both rates of return and the spreads, small enough. So what we will do is we will take log of both sides of our expression of the big and what we will get is it's easier to just copy it so on the left hand side we have log of this bracket to power h which means that it's just equal to h times log of 1 plus r that's how logs work powers from within logarithms uh, can be taken out as a multiplier same thing happens on uh, here with the 1 plus r to the power h which becomes h times log of 1 plus r log of the product is the same of sum of logs so we have this And equivalently, I see a question in chat, I will get to it in a second. If we get to it, uh, if we if we expand the last uh, fraction, if we split this fraction into two, we can use... We can say it's like this. So log of the fraction is log of the numerator minus the log of denominator. Now, question. Can I explain what the difference is between small r and large r? So, small r is the real return that the investors get after all the costs of trading. So, you put money into the asset, you waited some time, you sold it back, and r is exactly the return you got. Small r. Big r is what is how the price grows how the price of the asset grows on average so this mid quote MT and the whole point of today is to say that these are not exactly the same that if we as outside observers we just look at asset price and say well you know it grows at 5% a year uh, or say 10% a year, which means that this big R is 10% a year, this does not actually imply that the return that this asset generates to the investors is 10% a year. Because investors do not trade at the mid-code, but they have to take the spread into their calculations. So they buy at a price above the mid-quote and they sell at a price below the mid-quote so the real return R that they get is smaller than capital R and that's what we're trying to show now so we're trying to establish the relation between uh, these two so I hope that answered that and let us get back to our expression so we took logs of both sides of our expression and now we are actually using the approximation. So maybe I posted this, uh, made this assumption one line too early. I can actually do this. So now we use this approximation and we use it to get the following. 
So in this approximation, log of 1 plus big R is approximately equal to just small r. Then log of 1 plus small r is equal to just uh, small r. And same with these. So log of 1 plus s uh, over 2 is equal to plus s over 2. Not equal, but approximately. And then minus log of 1 minus s over 2 is approximately the same as minus s over 2. Which in the end just gives us uh, hr plus s on the right hand side. And if we divide both sides by r, we get this expression. Sorry, divide by both sides by h. We get that the two returns are tied by this expression. So the nominal return, the rate at which the asset price grows, will be above the real return exactly due to limited liquidity, due to spread, due to yeah, the fact that you buy the asset at price above the mid quote and sell it at price below the mid quote. And it's inversely related to your holding period. Basically, the larger is your holding period, the smaller is the um, cost per period, right? So this trading cost is basically a fixed cost of trading. Uh, you incur, you suffer once from a half spread when you buy the asset, and you suffer once more when you sell the asset. But there is no kind of fixed cost of, there is no, sorry, variable cost of holding the asset. So the longer you hold the asset, the less relevant uh, this trading cost becomes. But in the end, this is a very um, a simple reduced way to uh, obtain the result that liquidity premium exists and that uh, the returns that we observe in the data, the big R's, are actually above the real returns that the investors get small r. And that's what we call the liquidity premium. In particular, this s over h is the liquidity premium. It's by how much, yeah, to, to say it in a slightly different way, it's by how much faster the asset price must grow for the traders to be willing to uh, trade in it, given the fixed liquidity of this asset, which is given by this constant S. So, of course, this is all an approximation, this is all a very simple model, so it does not hold exactly, but this is one way of seeing it. So, this uh, goes through all the derivations that we just did. Now consider a slightly different scenario. So we just looked at a case when a trader bought the asset, held it for H periods, and then sold it. What if we look at the opposite direction? If we look at a round trip that starts from a sale, meaning that the investor sells the asset today, waits H, H periods, and then buys the asset back. And by doing so, the investor still requires return 1 plus R on kind of the funds that, uh, that he obtained. Or um, his loss from not having the asset should be kind of exactly R. So if we go through all the same motions in this case, we will obtain that actually the the nominal return will be lower than small r, than the required rate of return. So there should be an illiquidity penalty. And this leads us to my second question to you. So we now have two of these representations. We have um, r equal to r minus s over h, and we just derived previously that r can be equal to r plus s over h. 
So suppose that we know the nominal rate of return from market data. We know the rate at which the assets uh, were growing over time. And we want to back out the small r, the required rate of return by the investors. There are many reasons we want to do. Uh, we may want to do so. This can be to estimate uh, risk aversion of the agent, meaning what is the required rate of return given the risk profile of the asset. Or it can be for a variety of different reasons. So the question is, how do we do it? How do we learn r, small r from big r, given that we have two expressions for this? So should we use the first one? Should we use the second one? Should we use different ones depending on the aggregate supply of the asset? So we use one when there is positive supply and another one um, when the aggregate supply of the asset is negative? Or should we just ignore all of this and use our nominal rate R as kind of average of the two and say everything we just did is, is a nice exercise but you don't really want, want to use it. So, as usual, you have 30 seconds to think, and the time starts now. So, give me your answers. So we have a couple of fours. And I guess everyone else is uh, uncertain enough to not be willing to voice their opinion confidently. Uh, four is close enough. So probably the, the f absolutely formally correct answer would be three. And say we use the first one, the asset is in positive aggregate supply, and number two, when it's in negative aggregate supply. So why is this the the answer that is probably correct. So imagine you have positive aggregate supply, right? It means that you have more suppliers of the asset than you have the buyers of the asset. What this means is that the sellers will compete all of their profit away while buyers may enjoy some of the rents. So what does this mean uh, for our case? Buyers ben benefit from high nominal rate of return, from high big R, and suffer from low big R, right? Sellers uh, have the opposite. They suffer when big R is big, is large, because they miss out on a higher return by selling the asset, but they benefit if this big R is actually small. So if our capital R is large, it benefits the buyers and hurts the sellers. If our large big capital R is small, it benefits the sellers and hurts the buyers. So you would think that when the asset is in positive aggregate supply, there are more, once again, sellers than there are buyers. Given the choice of the two, we will choose the rate of return which is preferred by the buyers, because they have more bargaining power in this relationship, in this, in this market. And of the two, this is number one. This is the higher rate. So when there are fewer buyers, we get to enjoy the rate which is which yields the required rate of return to the buyers, but which is actually hurting the sellers. 
and it's two uh, when things are opposite when you have a negative aggregate supply when there are more buyers than sellers buyers suffer a loss while uh, the sellers get their required rate of return now there are many different layers on which I do not fully like my own answer to this first is that um, in what I just told you we have one group of traders which is suffering a loss and another one which breaks even given their rate of return it is it does not seem like an kind of situation that can happen in equilibrium right so probably our model is missing something important in there another dimension is I am not even really sure how to interpret negative aggregate supply of the asset so if an asset exists in the market it is in positive aggregate supply somebody produced it I would say and um, for individual traders whether they are willing to buy or uh, sell is in fact an endogenous decision right just as we saw in well pretty much all models so individual supplies are endogenous so I am not sure what it means to have all of these average out to a negative aggregate supply in total in equilibrium so I would say don't really worry about it too much most assets are in positive aggregate supply so you should just get this you should just use this formula there is a liquidity premium for holding the asset there is not a liquidity penalty for short selling the asset and that's what the empirical evidence actually finds so uh, there is quite a large chapter or section in the book that ex explores empirical evidence of the liquid on the liquidity premium I will not go through it in great detail but the general conclusion is many papers have found that there is actually a positive liquidity premium for um, stocks and bonds and financial assets in general so given that most traders start by buying the asset and then expecting to sell it later um, we get positive liquidity premium on average and a more general version of this model can be found in this relatively recent paper I have not looked at it in great detail so I don't really know what uh, what's in there but if you're interested you can have a look so this was a very very simple toy model and let us cover one more chapter before we go to the break and this section will be about clientele effects so let us agree that we just uh, uh, obtained the result that the nominal return on the asset should be equal to the real return the required rate of return plus uh, liquidity premium but in this toy model we only had one kind of representative investor with fixed holding period H well in reality you should think that there are actually many different people participating in the market many different e uh, economic agents you have institutional funds uh, institutional investors like pension funds that invest for relatively long periods of time and you can have hedge funds and all of the other algo traders who can trade the same asset 50 times in a given day so these expected holding periods are quite different for, for different investors so let us try to see what happens in our model if we introduce this heterogeneity in holding periods in the slides I go through a simple example with two assets with different spreads and two different types of investors with different holding periods uh, but I actually want to do it slightly differently that's the wrong window let me try to fix this this is definitely the wrong window 
this this is the right window right so how should we do it let me scribble the actual expression here for reference I have rearranged it a little bit but it looks like this so if you look at this expression you can reinterpret it as agents utility function so there small r is the real rate of return that they get on the asset right so it's kind of like the utility that they receive from holding the asset and they are facing choice within a realm of assets which have different nominal returns r and different spreads a s so let's say that we have R on vertical axis, S on the horizontal axis, and we have a realm of assets. Um, let me suppose, yeah, that it looks like this. So you can get you, in the market, you can find any asset in this set, under this black line. So given the spread, given some fixed spread, there are assets in the market which give you all kinds of nominal returns up to some level. And at this point, we really turn into micro 2 or micro 3. I don't really know where you did consumer choice, if you did it. I hope you did, that you did. And if you did, this picture will sound really similar, will look really similar. So let us interpret this as a consumer choice of products with two attributes. So the consumer chooses a bundle of S and R. And this is their budget set. And their indifference curves are given by the uh, utility function, are generated from utility function that is given by this by the required rate of return given nominal rate of return and spread. So what we will, how this will look like is for some type of investor, given their age, their indifference curves will be linear. They'll have negative slope and they will look like this. And so they will want to minimize the spread and maximize the rate of return meaning that uh, this indifference curve represents a higher level of utility than this indifference curve so let's say we have this uh, meaning that from this budget set our investor will choose the bundle which puts them on the highest indifference curve, right? So they will choose a bundle which lies at the point of tangency or the highest point of intersection between their indifference curve and the budget set. Now this is investor with some fixed holding period H. And let's say that this H was, H was high. Sorry, this H was low. So this is the trader who trades frequently. And now we'll have another trader who trades less frequently. Their age is large, their holding period is large. This will mean that their indifference curves are flatter. But it's still the case that they go in this direction. So utility improves as R grows and S decreases. So in a similar way, this investor will also choose an asset at the point of tangency of their highest indifference curve and the budget set. So it will be this asset. So this was high H. And this was investor with low H.
Now, the point of this drawing was to show you that if you have different kind of investors in the market, they will self-select into trading in different assets. So investors with small holding periods, the blue guys, will trade in assets which have smaller spread because they suffer more from these trading costs, right? Even though they will incur, uh, they will, sorry, have a um, lower nominal return on these assets. Those, on the other hand, who are willing to hold the assets for longer, the red guys with high age, will be uh, will be self-selecting into assets with maybe higher spreads with less li so they will trade in less liquid assets at larger nominal returns. And one thing you can see is that um, these red guys will also get a higher real rate of return. How can you see this? So how do you know which small r do these indifference curves correspond to? Well, you can actually see that small r equals to large r when s is zero. Meaning that The point of intersection of indifference curve with the r axis, so at this point s is zero on their indifference curve, and this is kind of the nominal rate of return that they would take for a perfectly liquid asset. So at this point, if this was the asset that they would be trading, they would not suffer from trading costs, meaning that they would not require any liquidity premium, meaning that this is the actual real rate of return that they would get. And this asset, uh, so blue trader is perfectly indifferent between this asset on the axis, this fictitious asset. We do not actually have it in the market, but we are assuming, we are pretending it's there. And the asset that they are actually trading. So this is the real rate of return that they are getting on their asset. Similarly for the red guys, they are indifferent between the asset that they are actually trading in equilibrium and this fictitional asset on the R axis. Again, this fictitional asset has zero spread, so the nominal rate of return on it coincides with the real rate of return that the investors actually get. So this real rate of return that the red investors get in this market, it's larger than the real rate of return for the blue asset. Traders who need to trade frequently forego some of the real returns in exchange for liquidity. And this is the bottom line here. Now if we go back to the slides. Uh, this example shows you more or less the same idea with, once again, two assets and two investors with two different... Damn it. With two different um, spreads and uh, holding periods. And I completely forgot that I also had another blitz quiz here which would ask you what would happen in this equilibrium. But uh, I spoiled it all already. How unfortunate. And this example goes uh, without pictures, through pure math. Uh, it, it shows basically that in the case when uh, investors with low holding periods trade in asset with low spread and as investors with high holding periods trade in less liquid assets is um, the only situation in which an equilibrium can arise in which solution exists to the equilibrium conditions and solution in terms of uh, nominal and real rates of return so we will not go through this So this is a nice little toy extension of our toy model and it shows that uh, some investors can specialize based on their characteristics. The conclusion although is slightly interesting because you get in the end that pension funds who hold assets for a long period of time will actually trade in relatively illiquid assets in assets that are uh, that have large spread 
which is possibly due to more adverse selection. So, in effect, pension funds will trade in riskier assets in this toy model, while hedge funds will just trade blue chips, very liquid, uh, very little adverse selection assets. This is not exactly something that we observe in the real world, as far as I know. But uh, this conclusion in this model just does not account for the explicit risk aversion of the agents. So we are igno ignoring fully the risk dimension. And um, if we had that, we could say that pension funds are actually more risk averse than hedge funds. So they are investing in less risky assets. And in the end, that risk aversion channel outweighs this channel that we just saw. So let us stop here, let us take a break, quick five minute break here. If you have any questions in the interim, feel free to ask. Uh, I guess there might be questions on this consumer's problem that we just saw, if you've never seen it before. So you have five minutes to formulate these questions and uh, we'll be right back.